This is Larry the Barberman and today I'm in Cambridgeshire. I'm with a trichologist by the name of Tracy Walker and today we shall be talking about poor sanitization in the barbershop and how that can affect your clients. As you may know, British barbering is not regulated. As such, this causes uh, a lot of bad practice in the area of sanitization which could end up with your clients visiting someone like Tracy. So today I'm just going to be talking through various situations with Tracy and Tracy can highlight the uh, areas of the problem areas that you could encounter. So Tracy, thank you for having me in your practice today. That's a pleasure, Larry. Yes. So like I said to you, British barbering is not regulated, so you know that this can cause quite a number of problems. What I need to know from you first before we go into the interview, what is it actually a trichologist does? And you're also the uh, director of education for the Institute of Trichology. Also tell me a little bit about your institute. Trichologists diagnose and treat hair loss and scalp disorders. We are almost a specialised form of dermatology, but we deal purely with the neck up. So we only deal with the scalp and the hair. We're not medically qualified, but we're medically trained in areas that we need to be to spot any potential problems. So we diagnose hair loss conditions, scalp disorders, and then we endeavour to treat them. And if we can't treat them, we will refer back to a GP or dermatologist. The Institute itself was set up back in 1902 and it was set up by a group of hairdressers and doctors and scientists who wanted to create more awareness about the problems that they were seeing with the hair and scalp and uh, we've been going ever since and we are a training body we educate students in the career of, of trichology okay so maybe you could share with me maybe three common conditions where a client from a barber shop has suffered some form of disease and comes to see you as a result of maybe poor sanitization or they've picked up a contagious disease maybe? Well, common conditions that we would see from patients coming in who have visited a barber shop would be bacterial infections. So for example, impetigo is very contagious, um, often happens around the, the mouth or above, above the, well, right by the top lip. Um, and these, uh, like I say, very contagious and can be passed from person to person um, by the barber themselves, just by touching their client. Fungal infections. There are a group of fungal infections that are termed dermatophytes that target skin, hair and nails. And again, these are very contagious. Very common in children, not so common in adults. Adults are more resistant to them. But you can imagine with children that can be, um, the infection can soon spread. And again, it can be spread by tools and by person to person. We see a lot of folliculitis, infection of the hair follicle, which can also be caused by perhaps the way the hair is being cut as well. Um, so that's quite common, um, especially in um, young black men. Okay, is that like an ingrowing hair? It can of? be an ingrown hair. Okay, so the first condition that you mentioned, what was the first condition? The impetigo bacterial infections. And you said that occurs above the lip. Describe what that looks like. It can be almost like a crusting of the skin. Um, and what actually happens is the bacteria that we have in our nose is quite happy in our nose, but if it happens to drip down, and you can imagine in children, if they've got a cold and they've got a runny nose, the bacteria drips down onto the top lip. And when the bacteria is in a different environment, it can become pathogenic and actually cause um, impetigo, the, the infection. It can look quite crusty, but sometimes it can just look a bit like a rash, a bit red, a bit scaly. So sometimes it could just look like dry skin and it could easily be missed by somebody that's not really expecting to see it. And you say that this can be passed on by maybe a barber not washing his hands as he goes on to another client? Is Absolutely. That... Impetigo is very contagious and definitely if the barber's moving the child's head and touching the area and then touching somebody else afterwards, that bacteria can be transmitted. 
So not only do they need to be sanitising their tools after every haircut, they should be sanitising their hands. Absolutely, they should be, yes. Okay, and then the second condition you mentioned? I mentioned ringworm, and there are various different types of ringworm. One of them can be what we call an ordinary scaly ringworm. So it can look like a, a patch of scaling on the scalp, which could be put down to dandruff or an eczema type condition. So again, it could be easily missed, but it's caused by uh, that it's a type of yeast, a fungus, called a dermatophyte, which actually targets hair and skin. But these dermatophytes can easily be transferred from person to person, as well as from tools as well. So generally, if it's a, an inanimate tool, like a comb or a brush, it's what we call a fomite, and the fomite can carry the infection from one person to the other. But also, we can, we can transfer it ourselves, human to human. So... Okay, so you said that kind of looks like dry skin like you it can do it can look like dry scaly skin that's the ordinary scaly ringworm and then there's also a black dot ring ringworm they're caused by dermatophytes but different types of dermatophyte so we wouldn't know what the infection was caused by unless it had uh, it was sent to the pathological lab and and uh, identified but the black dot ringworm um, you do get circular bald patches and in those circular bald patches you would get little short broken hairs but sometimes that's not visible until you look under a magnifying lamp so again they can easily be missed by somebody who's not trained in in the different disorders that you can get and sometimes if they're patchy they can look like another condition which we call alopecia areata which is very very common i was just gonna say and that's not infectious so somebody may say oh that's all right it's alopecia areata but don't realize it's a fungal infection and obviously if it's fungal then you can transfer it to other people so again this is through poor sanitization of the hands and poor sanitization of the tools it can be absolutely it does occur often in children and children often have their heads together and that can be transmitted that way but certainly in a barber shop you'd be looking at the the barber themselves transferring the infection or the tools if they're not cleaned properly that's quite interesting because you know we kind of in the barbering industry hammer on about cleaning the tools but a lot of it may be actually just in the fingers and the hands itself, which is never, ever talk, spoken about. So it's yeah. quite interesting that this has come up in this uh, interview, Tracy. Yes, yeah. yeah. And the last one you spoke about? Folliculitis. Now, that wouldn't exactly be something that would be transmitted person to person as such. It's not a contagious type of thing that can happen. But we do see it a lot when people have had very short haircuts or they've had their, hair, their head shaved. And what happens there is that black hair is, as you know, very curly hair. And when the hair is shaved, and almost it's probably gone slightly lower than the scalp surface, when the hair starts to grow up, it bends over and it scratches the scalp, tickles the scalp. When that happens, it's very itchy. So the patient or the client will then start scratching. Once they start scratching, that can cause secondary infection and can actually cause infection around the hair follicle. So it's not that it's transmitted as such, but it can also be caused by any excoriations to the skin, so any cuts or abrasions to the skin. So again, if somebody was having a, a shave or um, they were having even the clippers and they were just scratching the surface of the skin, it could actually cause the scalp to become very itchy and then the client would go home and be scratching that would then cause the infection, which we class as folliculitis. It's anything ending in itis is infection, and obviously it's around the hair follicle, so we term it folliculitis. So in black skin in particular, is, am I right in thinking that's when it's almost shiny, like like they've been burnt? Is that the same thing, or is it, does it look like ingrowing, like a cluster of bumps? How does that look exactly? It, it can look like a cluster of bumps um, but what we're terming then are keloids so bumps are actually keloids and keloids are scars and um, scarring is uh, more prominent in black skin and can run in families so not all black skin will scar and lead to keloids but keloids certainly are raised scars so they do come across as little bumps on the scalp 
and we often see that as a result of the folliculitis because the scalp has been scratched, the skin gets damaged and the damaged skin scars and then causes keloids. So that's a sort of keloids is a, severe, a more severe effect of Yes, yeah. the end result okay. really. Okay. Uh, the end result of the, the actual infection and the scratching uh, um, and the itchy scalp, the keloids would be the end result and it would scar the skin. And once the skin is scarred, no more hair grows through that area. So some people are prone to keloids, some people aren't. But even if they aren't prone to keloids, scarring can still occur, but then you'll get the flat, shiny effect. So again, no hair follicles will grow in that area. So. The itching can lead to scratching, the scratching can lead to damage to the scalp and when the scalp is damaged and if it's damaged permanently it leaves areas of scarring and then in some people it would lead to keloids as well if they're prone to that. Okay, thank you. And how could a barber or an individual safeguard themselves against getting keloids? Well if they're prone to keloids they certainly need to avoid any um, scratching, excess scratching of the scalp. It wouldn't happen with probably just a, a small scratch, but if you've got an itchy scalp and you're scratching continuously, you, you've got the, the problem that could occur. So you need to keep the scalp healthy. You need to use the right shampoo for the hair scalp type. Um, if the scalp's itchy, you can get ointments and lotions that you can put on to calm the itching down. And if somebody comes in suffering from folliculitis and they've got quite short haircuts we do encourage them to grow the hair a little bit because once that curly hair has grown it, it doesn't then tickle the scalp so if that's the cause of it then we encourage the hair to be a little bit longer if the hair is continually cut really short then that hair is continually going to grow up bend over tickle the scalp so you need to try and avoid what's causing the problem in the first place if you're prone to scarring and, and keloids you can't take that away completely, but you need to take away the causative factors. Okay. And you spoke about healthy scalp, keeping the health, the scalp healthy. Yes. This could help to avoid that situation by keeping a, trying to keep a perfectly healthy scalp. Absolutely. What we know about black skin is it has a tendency to be quite dry, especially in this British climate. And when the scalp gets dry, it can become quite itchy. When the scalp's itchy, we, we, you know, I, I defy anybody to not scratch an itchy scalp. So what we're trying to do is keep the scalp as healthy as possible, keep it moisturised. The skin on the scalp is the same as the skin everywhere else on our body. So if we have dry skin anywhere else, we would put moisturiser on and we can do the same with the scalp and that will keep the scalp healthy. And in trichology clinics, we often see people with um, itchy flaky scalps, we'll put ointments on, clean the scalp up, give them treatments. We steam a lot, so we're putting moisture back into the hair and scalp by steaming. And that helps to keep the hair and skin hydrated, which helps to prevent the problems in the first place. But if it's a mild problem, just a slight itching, then use a shampoo for an itchy scalp that helps to keep that healthy. Okay, severe forms of keloids they would have to visit you and then go into this steroid <coughs> treatment and so forth is that right yeah um, we wouldn't as trichologists normally do that we would normally refer on to a gp and they can have um the the, the keloids they can have um surgery surg surgery on them um to remove them but then you've got to be a little bit careful because the surgery itself could actually cause a keloid because if if you're prone to that then any abrasions on the scalp can cause keloids <clears throat> but if they are quite big and sometimes we do see them quite big that I think I do believe that they can use steroid injections to um, remove them as well or to, or to diminish them so the moral of this uh, talk right now with regards to keloids if you see the smallest signs of them run to your GP yeah and certainly um, you know visit a trichologist if you want more help on how to look after their the hair and scalp Unfortunately, trichologists do often see patients who have had problems for a long time and we get frustrated because we feel if we'd have seen them earlier, we probably could have helped them and they, we could have helped them to avoid the trauma. So certainly if there's the slightest problem, go and talk to somebody and, and see what you can do about it. Okay. So moving on, what I'd like to do for you, Trace, <laughs> is give you three scenarios within a barbershop and I just kind of want you to talk me through the potential 
risk of a contagious disease being passed. Mm. So the first situation I want to talk about is a European guy goes into a barber shop, he has long hair, he just wants a little bit of hair taken off. Barber puts the cape onto the client, sprays down his hair. And what I often see is that the water from the scalp runs down the neck. And if they don't have a necktie, mm -hmm. there's like a, I don't know, an accumulation of damp water in that collar. Mm. Could that infect a potential client in a barber shop? Well, the first thing it would do is be uncomfortable. If the cape or the gown is wet around the neck and it's rubbing on the skin, it could cause the skin to be quite uncomfortable. It may not cause an immediate problem if the person is healthy and the skin is unbroken. But what you have to bear in mind is that somebody's susceptibility to infection will increase if there are open wounds. So for example, if somebody has eczema that affects the back of the neck or psoriasis where the skin's broken, then infection, bacterial infection, will get into that, to those open wounds. And that's what we call a secondary infection. And then you've got um, persons who might be on medications, um, immunosuppressants, so therefore they're more susceptible to picking up infection. Um, age as well, older people and also young children are more susceptible to infections. And again, we've talked about fungal infections, bacterial infections, so the cape could actually act as if it hasn't been cleaned and, and then it gets wet and rubs against the skin, that could increase the, the uh, rate of infection in somebody. So you would definitely recommend a necktie with every service a barber provides to a client? I would, and actually nowadays you can buy disposable gowns and towels, which I think are fabulous. We have them in our clinic in London and you just use them for one patient stroke client and then throw them away. And that way you don't have the problem and they're quite cost effective. You haven't got to go and wash them either. So it does work out, you know, really um, inexpensive. And then you're, you can really be assured that you're not going to be passing anything on, everything's disposable. And just very quickly, what are some of the things that could be passed on? Well, you said it's very low risk, but nonetheless, what could of it be? Of course, but again, we're talking about um, fungal infections would probably be high on the list because um, they would affect all areas of the scalp and the neck. Uh, I talked about bacterial infections in Patigo earlier. That tends to be more around the face, so it probably wouldn't affect the neck so much. But again, like I say, sex, uh, we, the client could get a secondary bacterial infection which could then cause a lot of problems. So we're really looking, we're, we're looking at the sort of, probably with capes and gowns, we're looking more at bacterial infections, really. Okay, cool. um, but it wouldn't be very pleasant either to be putting something that's not very clean on somebody. It would smell as well. It wouldn't be very pleasant for the client. I'm only speaking from experience, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see how much at yeah. risk I really was. Yeah. Okay, so scenario number two, mm -hmm. the skin fade. Uh, but whether it's a Caucasian or Afro-Caribbean person goes into a barber shop, asks for a skin fade, mm -hmm. he's gowned up, then the skin fade process is pretty much started by the barber brushing down vigorously with the brush and then uh, going up vigorously with the clipper, coming yeah. down with the brush, up with the clipper, down with the brush, up with the clipper. I think in a lot of situations, these brushes are not sanitised Clippers are not are sanitised, but they don't necessarily go through the time period required for the disinfectant to work correctly. Mm. Talk me through some of the problems that could occur through the common skin fade. Straight away, brushing the hair vigorously is something that trichologists don't... It, it makes us kind of cringe. We don't like that. And, and combing the hair vigorously, it, it causes so much damage to the hair itself. It can break the hair off, but also to the scalp. The skin is a really good barrier. Um, it, it prevents a lot of infection if it's healthy. If we've got a good skin coverage, uh, there's no open wounds or anything, then our skin works well and it actually prevents a lot of infection from and a lot of bacteria from entering uh, the deep levels of skin. But once what we call the abraded. Once the skin's abraded, 
uh, and the top layer of skin is taken off, then bacteria and yeasts and fungus can actually get into the skin and can get down to the deeper layers. So again, a lot of bacteria and fungal infections, uh, we, we have yeast and bacteria on our scalp, it lives there quite happily most of the time, but it lives on the outer layers. The minute we abrade the skin and we lift that top layer off and the bacteria and yeast get a little bit further down, they become pathogenic and that's when they start to cause disease and infection. So immediately when you say that brushing the hair vigorously, combing the hair vigorously, you, it's most likely the scalp is going to get damaged through that process. Okay. What can happen then is that as well the skin can become sore, it can become itchy, the client can go away and start scratching and they can get secondary infections. But also if the equipment is not particularly clean, you can only imagine that if that's been used on several people, and then it's used on somebody and, and the yeast and bacteria on that brush gets into the deeper layers of the skin again, it has the potential to cause infections. And yeah. um, that could cause a lot of problems for a client and, and can lead to hair loss as well, so. Yeah, because unlike, you know, a lot of the time, barbers are talking about the tools, but like I've just identified, we don't necessarily talk about the hands mm. and the brush is often overlooked and never cleansed or sterilized yeah how important would you say is to sterilize a brush after yeah. every cut bearing in mind that in the barber shop the skin fade and the vigorous brushing down and up with the clipper and down yeah. with the brush it's going to be very important isn't it and they're going to be busy they're going to be in a barber shop they're going to be busy but you have to have enough combs and brushes where you can then sanitize them afterwards the best way to do that is to have your barberside jars and it takes something like 10 minutes to sanitize, to disinfect your equipment. So if you had two of everything or three of everything, you could be sanitizing one after a client, using a fresh one and then swapping over. But you mentioned earlier about the correct way as well of sterilizing, and that's really important. It's all right having a bar barbicide jar, but what I've seen is that people will just, after using the comb, just put it straight in that's no good, you have to clean it first, because if you can imagine there's oil or dirt on the comb, putting it in water isn't going to, it's not going to be able to remove that oil or dirt. So you have to clean it first with a detergent, rinse it well, and then put it in a barbicide jar with fresh barbicide for that day. Um, and ideally use hot water, because if the water's hot, the barbicide will be more effective than if you put it with cold water. Okay. And, and another thing really is, is ideal to have two barbicide jars so you could actually put used combs in one and all the staff know that that's the used one and the next one is ready to, to be used because if somebody puts a comb into the jar and somebody else comes along and takes it straight out again it won't have had the 10 minutes and it won't be sterilised so you do have to think of that as well but they're simple measures that could really help. Okay and one thing I did fail to mention to you guys Tracy is actually formerly a hairdresser so if you if you think back to just a second ago she spoke about a busy uh, salon environment she even though she's a trichologist she understands your trials and tribulations and she's just giving you a practical practical tip on how you can keep your tools sterilized all the way through your treatment so I thank you very much for that Last situation, client walks into a barber shop, wants a hot towel shave. The face is steamed with a towel that was cleaned in a domestic uh, washing machine. Uh, the barber uses a blade that was used on the previous client. He uses a badger brush that was just washed with hot water to apply mm. the cream to the face. What? dangers or hazards do you see in what I just spoke to you about just then? Absolutely, the same things that we've mentioned before, bacterial infections um, can be transferred, um, fungal infections. Now with towels they could be boil washed which would give them more protection so if they were on a very hot wash in the washing machine that may protect them a bit more but if it's just a regular cycle and most people are, are putting them on low cycles to um, save energy and for it to be more cost effective so that certainly wouldn't um, um, it wouldn't work with a towel it wouldn't be sterile um, 
also water on its own is is i mean there's bacteria in water i mean it just water on its own would not sterilize equipment so brushes towels and things would have to be washed properly um, if somebody had a, if you had a steam cabinet or something and you were putting towels in a steam cabinet, then that should suffice because the steam would be at a certain temperature that would kill a lot of microorganisms. But certainly you would need to wash the equipment after every client and you would have to sterilise it. Um, we mentioned fungal infections, they're quite common in the beard area. So again, if you're using towels and equipment on the beard area, not really washing them properly, or cleaning them properly or sterilizing them and then you're going on to the next person you can only imagine that those infections are going to get transferred and transmitted to somebody else and with the i spoke about the badger brush because you know the badger by nature it's the the hair store is good for storing heat and keep it, retaining the heat and mm. it's a porous brush would that be cleaned by just running it through hot water or would it need some more intervention? No, it, it certainly wouldn't. It would need at least cleansing with a detergent to remove any oil or dirt. Um, but even that wouldn't sterilise it, that would only clean it. So you would have to look at ways of being able to sterilise um, equipment there. So you've got other things that you could use, um, UV cabinets, although again you've got to leave it in there for the length, of, they've got to be the equipment's got to be clean before you put it in and it's got to be left in long enough for it to work properly. Um, you can also use steam to clean things, autoclaves and things. I don't know how common these are in barber shops though. They would be in a hospital but they wouldn't be in a barber shop. So we have to make it realistic for people to be able to do their job and, and not be worrying and spending a huge amount of time. Um, but you could also... Um, with brushes there's no reason and when I was hairdressing what you do sometimes if you've got a bristle brush is you could actually pop it in some liquid but but leave out the handle or the you know so that you're not actually wearing the wood or the, or the handle away but actually cleanse the brush and then just sort of dip it in some barbicide or, or something that you could sterilize it with but you certainly need to do something you can't use the same equipment on one client and then use it on the next client without thoroughly cleaning it um, and sterilising it to some extent. Some barbers have spoken about, um, I'm not sure of the name, it's a baby's steriliser, they sterilise baby's bottles and stuff like that, and I forgot the name of it though. Yeah, and I can't think of it either at the moment, but I know which one you mean, where they put it in the, the baby con the containers yeah. and they put the um, um, baby equipment and things in. Absolutely fine to use that as well, that should work too. Okay. Um, and it might be a bit milder, whereas the barbicide might be a, a, maybe not so desirable for something that's going to be used on the face. Maybe that would be um, better to use, perhaps. Mm -hmm.